I mean, what made Jesus' revelation so special? When he finally came, it was because here, for, after long last, we are seeing the image of God. We are seeing God's plan be revealed. We are seeing God himself being revealed. What did he tell, um, what did he tell Thomas in John 14? Excuse me, Philip. Philip, have I been with you this long? And you, have, and, you, and you say, show me the Father? He who has seen the Father has seen me. Jesus was the revelation, revelation of God. And he came so that we would know God's will. Uh, Romans 1 talks about the idea of the gospel and in 16 and 17 it says I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ it is the power of God to salvation why for it is the righteousness of God revealed it is about God it is about God's plan it is about God's sacrifice it is about all that God has called us to do and the minute that the gospel becomes about anything other than God I've missed it I've missed the point. 2 Peter 4.11, when he talks about speaking as the oracles of God, he's also talking about him who serves, him who ministers. Why? We do all these things as they are given to us by God, so that in all things God will be glorified. Our gospel mission has to glorify God. It is not about glorifying men. It is not about glorifying my intellect. It is not about me explaining this great theory that I just came up with. It is not about me showing my my expertise in the Bible, it is about glorifying and holding up God, and by doing so, I am always going to put God and his message before my own ideas and my opinions. What happens when we take the focus of God? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, let's read verse 3 and 4. He's warning the Corinthians here. And in fact, we'll back up to verse 2. He says, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you received a different spirit from the one who received it, or if you accept a different gospel from the one who accepted, you put up with it readily enough. In other words, you're more than happy to listen to somebody else who comes in and gives you a different version. Why? Because I'm no longer concerned so much that the version is from God. I'm concerned about how the version sounds to me. Does it impact my life well? Do I agree with it? Does it make sense? Um, you know, in John 7... When Jesus is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, he says that those who speak of his own authority seek his own glory. When I just make it up as I go along, I'm not doing it to glorify God. Because I'm not glorifying God. I'm glorifying myself. Or I'm glorifying you because I'm saying that I, you know, it's the whole have it your way thing. If my, if my first importance and my priority in preaching the gospel is to preach something that you will agree with, my focus is no longer on God. My focus is now on the messenger. But when Paul was talking to the Galatians, how did he prove that he was who he said he was? What did he go to to authenticate his apostleship? He did so by saying, I never heard any of this from man. I didn't get this from man. I I didn't get it from the apostles. I didn't get it from anybody else. But it was a revelation directly from God himself. And it wasn't three years later before I finally talked to the apostles. The idea that my message is not about what's popular or what people would think was useful, but my message is what has God revealed to me? And we have to ask ourselves that question. Am I glorifying God in my message? Does the gospel that we preach glorify God, or does it glorify me? Or does it glorify the church of Christ? Let's, let's be very real about this. Am I converting people to Christ, or am I converting people to the church of Christ? There is a difference. And we got too many people that have been converted to the church of Christ. And when that happens, where's my faith? It's not in God. It's in the preacher. It's in the elders. It's in the fact that we can get enough people to come together to where it's fun for me to worship. We've lost our focus of God. Our gospel has to be focused on God. A heartfelt response. We have to have a heartfelt response. This is where it gets back to that idea that the gospel is something to be obeyed. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. Um, the word obey there, I looked this up because I was curious. And the word is not strictly translated obey. In other words, it doesn't just mean to do what you are told. It means to hear, under. In other words, basically you're a subordinate and someone tells you to do something and you listen like a subordinate. 
I'm going to go out on a limb and say that everybody in here who has had kids at some point has asked the question, didn't you hear what I told you? And it was always prompted by somebody going around doing whatever they weren't supposed to be doing, and you told them earlier, I don't want you to do that, or I want you to do this, and they're not doing it, or they're doing something else. And you ask, you don't ask, you, did, why aren't you doing what I asked you to do? You ask, didn't you hear me? Because there's an implication there. Because if you heard me, you would be doing what I said. We understand that in real life. But what happens a lot of times is we take our common sense and we throw it out the window when we read the Bible. Because all the things that we understand normally, we don't really make that connection. Well, well, the Bible just says believe. It doesn't say obey. It doesn't say anything about having to do anything. But the idea is that in Vines it talks about the idea that when I have faith, the, the word belief and the word faith are interchangeable. They're the same word. Just a, it's a noun and a verb, basically. And the idea is that my faith is not in the message. You haven't told me something that convinces me. You don't, you don't sit down with your child and say, now, son, this is why you need to have a clean room. Now, if you have a clean room, it promotes your health and you know, bacteria won't grow and you'll be able to find what And it's, well, that's a good point. I'm going to do that. Because I think that this makes sense. That's not the gospel message. The faith that we're talking about is in the messenger. God has told me this, therefore I believe it. God has instructed me to do this, and as a result of that, because I know who God is, I'm going to follow his instructions. The gospel's purpose, and I think it's ironic, in the book of Romans, is the book that it always people will go to to justify the idea of faith without obedience. You know, Abraham was justified by faith apart from works. He didn't have to do anything at all to be justified. And yet in the very beginning of the passage in the book, Paul talks about the idea and he ends it in the same way. The idea of the gospel being designed to bring about what? The obedience of faith. The idea that the gospel message is supposed to provoke you and cause you to respond in a way because it is meaningful to you. Not because... Not because you are required to do it, but because when, as in Acts 2.37, when they were pricked in their hearts, and what did they say? Men and brethren, what shall we do? I need to fix this. There's a problem here. And I'm motivated. I want to do something about it. That's the purpose of the gospel. To move me to obedience. 